We'll get that up in a sec. I guess before I forget, we are planning a Bible quiz night on the, well, not night, but in the afternoon of the 23rd of September, so starting at about 3 o'clock. So there'll be more details. You can either see Leora or Joan later. They're arranging the details of it, but there is a quiz night on the 20, oh, quiz afternoon on the 23rd, which is a Saturday. Um, before we start, I might just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together again, Lord, around your word. Just pray as we open it today, it will speak to our hearts, Lord, and that we'll be ready to receive the message it gives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to continue on in the book of John. It's taken me much longer than I thought it would, but we're slowly getting there. And we're going to be... Turn this on. John 17 this week. So we've got so far, the last few months, been going through very slowly just the Last Supper. And this is sort of where Jesus wraps it all up. So he's given his last instructions to the disciples. He's prepared them for what's coming as best he can, told them how he's going to die. He's told them of the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's told them of all these things. And now once he's said all of this, it comes to here where we start it. And it's probably a very famous prayer. So we often know of, well, we often taught the Lord's Prayer. And many people would actually say, this is the Lord's Prayer. The other prayer that we learn, that's the disciples' prayer. But this is the prayer that Jesus actually prays for the disciples. So if you've got your Bible, or follow along there, we'll start reading John 17. So Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. And as you've given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which I've, you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory with which you, sorry, which I had with you before the world was. So as I said, Jesus has just finished giving all his instructions to the disciples. And after doing all of that and preparing them and saying he's going away, he turns his eyes to heaven and he starts to pray. Because he knows basically all the work that he's done it's finished. And it got me thinking, and it's a big theme through his prayer here, this word glorify. Glory, glorify, you'll find it scattered all throughout this prayer. It's what's on Jesus' mind. And it really wraps up what his whole thing has been when he came here to earth. And I've been trying to just work through exactly what does it mean to glorify. Have we got any glory seekers in the church at all? Nobody who wants the glory of men. No one out to, to do something heroic, make a name for themselves. What's that? Not unless the Lord. Well, I think really deep down a lot of us do have a desire for glory. We want to be the best at things. We want people to just respect us. When they think about our name, we want them to be looking up to us. We want them to think that we really are the best of something. We do it, and one of the reasons I say it is, look at how people chase after fame and stuff. They seek it through fame, they seek it through wealth, or it could be through sport. You aim to be the best. You want to be the one who stands out amongst everyone else. And most of us have had those dreams, you want to be the champion at whatever it is that you do. And you probably see more of it, you might take glory as we come to the footy season and wrapping up in the finals, you want to take glory in your team being the best, you've got bragging rights. If you're the best, you've put it over everyone else. So all of us do have some sort of idea or some desire to be glorified. So Jesus, as he comes to the end of it, his ministry here, his prayer to the Father is, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. 
And that's been Jesus, what his work's been about the whole time. And if you think about the situation as he's come into the world, he's come in, there's an expectancy in the Jewish kingdom of a Messiah. They're looking and waiting for another Messiah to come. They've had the Maccabees come in at that time, not long before he came into the world, and they fell away, and now they're under Roman rule. The, king, the Israelites are there waiting for another Messiah to come, a physical hero who'll come along and save them from all their enemies and make them the top in the world again. And there was a bit of a desire when Jesus came out that he's going to be the Messiah. All the people were getting excited. But Jesus was a little different from what they were expecting. Because Jesus wasn't seeking a gathering together for himself. As much as everything he did, he gave glory to his Father. He said, look to the Father. I do the works of my Father. My Father, my Father. Go back and read the last 16 chapters of John. Just count how many times he refers to his Father. But when he comes here and his prayer is now, he says, glorify your Son. Because it's coming to a critical point in his ministry. He's done all the words and the talking that he can do. And he knows he's going to be put to death. But in that, he wants the Father to testify of him. Give him the glory that he was due. All the people have seen him here just as a man. And they say, you can't be God. And he said he's been one with God. I and my Father are one. But there's many people who don't believe it. And his prayer is now that as he comes to this point, with what's about to happen, he wants God the Father to show and reveal who he is. So there can be no doubt from anyone about who he is and what he says he is. And his reason for doing that is because that will justify all he said before about he and his Father of one your son may also glorify you. Because if God glorifies him, it proves that Jesus is who he said he was. And if he's who he said he was, that means that they need, his father is true. All that he said about his father is true. And it's particularly relevant for then, as it is for today, because I mentioned that they were waiting for a Messiah. But when you look at it, he exposed what they were really looking for. And the arguments just before all of this was they were saying, we know who our father is and what we trust. We are children of God, they told him. God is our father. And he told him, you didn't know God. You're hypocrites. So he is seeking justification in this time when they think they're going to have the final victory by putting him to death. He wants God to show, no, you're wrong. I am truly God, and you are God. So this is just as you've given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I've glorified you on earth. I've finished the work which you've given to me do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had before you before the world was. And that rings back to the start of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's been claiming and pointing, he's showing all these signs that he is God here on earth. And the reason he's wanted to do it is because he wanted to give life to the nation again, to give life to people. Because they thought they were all right. They thought they were waiting for a Messiah. They thought that they knew God. And he came to earth to show them how wrong they were. That they'd been following their own dreams and their own desires. Jesus' mission when he came was to give eternal life. And how does he give it? In verse 3 it tells us, the only way to eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. You can't have life if you don't know God. If you don't know and believe God and keep his commandments, do what he has said, keep his word. 
So it's setting up towards a final decision again. Or maybe I shouldn't say final, but all throughout John, he's been posing this question, will you believe? What do you believe about Jesus and what do you believe about God? You might think you've got it worked out. You might think you're doing the right things. But this is the key matter of the whole gospel. Do you really believe God? Will you believe him enough to recognize Jesus is God and to follow him? I put up that slide, learning to be a disciple at the start of all these messages in John because that's what it is. Are you willing to be a disciple, to follow him? And you can only do that if you believe in him. So Jesus is seeking in this most testing time for the disciples that's about to come, when he's going to be put to death, he wants God to reassure them and show everyone that he is who he said he was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known, sorry, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. As I've said, Jesus has spent all this time, and his purpose there was to manifest, to make known, to reveal God's name amongst men. They called out, they, went to the tab they had the temple there. They were calling on him, yet they didn't know him. God has revealed who God is and real, revealed his real name to them. He's revealed it to these disciples, these lowly men, who the Father is. And it says there that they've kept your word. So they've learnt in these three years to learn to trust him and what he says. No matter how strange, how, I guess, confusing it might have been to them when he asked them to do things that they could keep that he would keep his word and that they could trust him and Jesus gave them all the words he's told them the scriptures and revealed the message to them again and the one that's so hard is that God came down to earth as a man that Jesus was sent forth from God I said it's a hard concept to get right, particularly for the Jewish people who believe that God is one. There is only one God, God the Father. So to believe that Jesus could be God come down in flesh is a stumbling block. And probably is still for us today. If you are walking here, do you expect to find Jesus in our midst? Two or more gather, we say it, do we believe it? I mention again Genesis, because just been reading through that, where it talks all this time, the angel of the Lord. There were physical appearances of God to men. Do you expect God to be here and present in your life? Or is he just some idea that we've got up here? God is just an idea, it's the making of our minds, God. And he's whatever we want him to be. So this idea that God is present and could be present with us, it is a hard thing to get your mind around. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, most of us, we don't expect God to be at work with us. And in our lives, it's just, okay, there might be things, but is he actually around us? Could he actually be physically present with us? And they had to come and believe that, these disciples, that Jesus, a man that they could see and look upon, that he was God. And then have to go and juggle that with the idea that we've only got one God, God the Father. 
Not that he's a separate God, but he is God our Father here with us. And if you don't struggle with it, you're probably not being honest. Like we explain the Trinity, explain God how you can have three in one in a clear way that makes sense to everybody. If you can do it, you're better than all the theologians in the world who have been, who are still fighting over it, how to explain it best. I know it seems so straightforward when we read it, why are you, why are you just dwelling on this? We've got it, we believe, okay? Because if we believe it, how is it showing in our lives? And how what is it meant to show in the disciples' lives when it comes to this test? Because that's really what the question comes to. If you believe it, what is the result then in your life? Is it just coming to church? That's the result of believing in God? I can be a good Christian. I can come to church on a Sunday or go to a Bible study. I can do all those things. I can say, hallelujah, in church. That's the difference it makes. That's the question he's posing because that's not the future that he's got in front of him. It's not meet in the synagogue, everything's going to be all right. His prayer for them now is because he's facing death and so are they. Do you believe it then when your life's on the line? Are you willing to stake your life for the fact that Jesus is God? And it's where the rubber hits the road. Because now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. It's been easy in one, easier in one sense because they had him there with him. Whenever these troubles, whenever the opposition came, they could just turn to Jesus and he would fix their problems. They could stand behind him and he's in the firing line. But now Jesus is going. And his concern is for these disciples when he's not there. When they can't see him physically in front of them, when they can't hide behind him physically, what will they do? So his prayer is that God will keep them. I've given them your word. Keep through your holy name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are one. So, like I said, while I was in the world, I kept them in your name. So while he was there, he could keep them. It was easier to follow. When your mouth, the one you're following is there in front of you, it's always easier to go and follow someone. When you don't have one standing, what often happens? If you don't have a boss at work or in the military, I'm sure you know, you don't have someone leading the command, what happens? Things can often fall apart. And he's saying basically, I want them to know the plan. I want them to have understood and grasped this. So even though I'm not in ahead of them now, they'll know what they've got to do. They can keep on because they know that what I've said is true. Even though it doesn't seem like it at the moment. And that they can have their, my joy fulfilled in themselves. So not sitting there in sorrow thinking, okay, I've just got to plot along now, I've just got to put up with it. But they really grasp the truth of his words. He's told them this is going to happen. He's told them they're going to suffer. He's not there with them now, but think about where he's gone. He's gone to the Father in heaven. 
He's gone to prepare a place, a home for them, better than what they've got. Here on earth they won't have a home, they'll have enemies. There they'll have presence with God. They'll have a new place prepared for them. And he's asking God to give them one last reassurance when he said, reveal my glory so that they'll know. God, keep them from evil so that they don't give way. I've kept them all except one. All except this one who turned to destruction. And we know that so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He kept one of them even though he knew what Judas was like. Even though he knew Judas would choose money over him. He kept all of those with him and kept them and taught them the truth. One's turned away, what's to stop another? God, keep them and may they have joy when this hatred comes. Because they're not going to have a well, not going to have a place in this world anymore. The world don't doesn't want them, and they're going to have to live as though they don't belong in this world anymore. Just as I don't belong there, I belong with my Father in heaven. Can we really grasp that as Christians? What are the plans and goals you have for life? What's that? To please the Lord? We would hope it is and pray it is true. I guess I'm a bit younger than a lot here, so it's different goals, but is it okay? It might be to have a house to start with, it might be to have a family. Probably when you get older, my desire is to just take care of the kids, to play with the grandkids, to do different things like that. It might be to go and have my holiday to tour around Australia. Often our goals revolve around us and what we want to do. And we live for the things of this world and the pleasures we can get out of them. Do we live as though this isn't our home? Because whatever we think where our home is, we'll do whatever we can to protect it. If your house looks like it's on fire, you look to protect it. You protect the more possessions you've got, the more time you spend taking care of them. The more time that you, your time and focus is there. But if it's not yours, and you realize they're temporary, and that your real home is in heaven that can't be taken away, what does that actually do? What's the actual consequence of that reasoning? If the things of this world, and they're not your possessions, and you don't belong here, you're not going to spend all your time trying to save them or build up a kingdom here on earth. If you've grasped, if we've grasped, the truth of his words, that he's gone to heaven and that is our home, he said we're going to be with him, does it matter what happens to our body here? Does it matter anymore? If someone threatens you, threatens to take away, they're taking away something that doesn't matter anymore because they can't take away the things of heaven. So no longer can the world threaten you anymore. Try as they will, you've got nothing to fear. We have testimony time here. It's one small example to show whether we've got fear or we've got courage. They said, we're here in a church amongst people, pretty well everyone here would confess they follow the Lord. What holds us back from telling us what God has done? If we're honest, what holds us back? Where is our mind, I'm including myself obviously, but where is our mind, where is our attention? We're afraid someone might criticize us. Afraid we haven't got any, well, if we don't have anything to say, where's our mind be? Are we living for this world or for the one in the future? They might seem like simple words, but when you spend some time to think about it, there's a big effect that these should have on us. The simple thing of saying we're not of this world.
I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. He doesn't pray that they'll have an easy life or that they'll miss all these things that are about to happen. He doesn't say, okay, just keep them all safe and keep them out of trouble. They're mine. God, don't let them go through hard times anymore. That's not his prayer. His prayer is that they will be kept from choosing evil instead of good, from choosing the evil one and what he wants. Because the devil tells us we can be like God. It's the temptation he gave to Adam and Eve in the garden. You can be like God. You can be in charge of your life to do what you want. God's keeping things back from you. Take the fruit and you can live like God. Sanctify them by the truth. He prays that they would be kept from the evil one and that they would be set apart by the truth, by their knowledge and the way that they live out this truth. Because what God the Father has said is truth. It's not just a truth, like the world tells you, you get to pick your a certain truth. It says, this, your word is the truth. What's this word that God said? Just as I have given eternal life through believing in the Father and in Jesus Christ. What does it all boil down to following God? It boils down to how much you believe that statement. Because if you really believe it, it's going to flow out in your life, in my life, in the way we live. Jesus is God, he's given his life, he's taken away the penalty. We get that part fine. But the other parts, if you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll go out and you'll tell others and share that news with others. You'll want others to go where God is, to share in that glory that he has in heaven. This is the truth. He says, sanctify them. He's praying to God the Father that these disciples of his will be set apart by the way they hold on to these words that were said, Jesus' words. He doesn't want them to avoid all the suffering. He says, God, keep them. He doesn't want them taken out of the world yet. They're there to stand in this world as a beacon of truth. A couple of chapters ago, I shared about, or Jesus shared, about I am the vine. And in that, it was a picture of what Israel was meant to be. And Israel's purpose was to be a light among the nations. And then he said that they are to be the light of the world. That's their job. And when does light shine the brightest? In the midst of darkness. When all the bad and people try to criticize you, that's when it really stands out most what you believe in. To God, set them apart, sanctify them by the truth. Because that's how the world's going to know. And I've sent them into the world. Just as God sent Jesus into the world to be a light, I have sent them into the world. That's their job and their purpose. It's not to be hidden away in a church building. It's not to be a private Christian. What you believe is your business, what's mine is mine. It's to go out and to share what is true. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. 
I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It's all fine and good for the disciples then, they just spent three years in apprenticeship. But this should be uplifting for us as well as also, I guess, convicting for us too. This time in verse 20, he's not just praying for those disciples that he spent that time with. I don't pray for these alone, but also for all those who believe in me through their word. That means you and me today. We believe because we read the Bible, which is the testimony of the disciples. John in particular, all the things that we've seen and heard, we've told. So he's praying for us today. Jesus had us on his mind then when he was praying. And what was his desire for us today? That we may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That we may be one in us and that the world may believe that you sent me. There's three things. He wants us to be in unity with, what, with God. If you don't believe God's word, you're not in unity with him, are you? If you only believe parts of it, you're not going to be in unity. He's praying that the, all believers would be in unity, that they may be one as the Father is one. Jesus did what his Father desired. Is that our desire? That's what his prayer would, that everyone who believes in him that they would be united in the way that they want to do what Jesus said. And that they may be one in us. And Jesus has said the Holy Spirit's going to indwell. He's going to be within them. God is going to be literally there with you. And the third purpose, that the world may believe that you sent me. He wants the world to know that the world will go and believe. He doesn't want that the world to, should perish. And we probably all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. And the following verse, he didn't come to condemn but to save the world. His desire is that not just a few believe, but the whole world would come to this same knowledge. And verse 22, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. It's a big statement. What's the glory that God had? He was there with God from the very start. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's asked God to give him the glory back which he had. And now he asks that all believers would share in that glory. Give them the glory that you gave me. So that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. God hasn't abandoned the world. God is here and present in the world and he desires us. He's left us with a task now, each and every one of us who say we follow him, to go out and to tell the world about him and to share in the glory of God. And that we might be united and that we can be perfected as we do that. Because as we seek God and seek Jesus to follow him truly with every part of our being, we're going to be perfected in one. And that's going to stand out in the world because the world just fights and looks out for itself. We will stand out and they'll see that Jesus, that God loves the world because that's what we're sharing, a message of life. As he said before, this is eternal life. Belief in me is life. 
So as we share belief in Jesus, we're sharing the message of life. We're sharing that God still loves the world. And it should be what's shaping all of our desire if we really believe that Jesus is God. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, for they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared it to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus' desire was that they may be with him again. He's given the Holy Spirit, he's gone away to heaven to be with his Father and his desire is for everyone who believes in him to be with him and to see Jesus in his form, in his glorious form with God in heaven. Not bound by the physical world, restricted at that time as he was on earth, but to see him as he originally was and to see the love between that the Father has. So it's a very powerful prayer and it's one that we can take a lot of comfort in but it also brings a conviction if we say we follow him and we're not living it out because there's something that doesn't add up. Do we have that life in us? It's very easy to say words sometimes, they slip out, we try to cover ourselves. And we can say a lot of things that we don't really believe. We've had Jesus before, as he went to the cross, as he was faced with pain and suffering, he had us on his heart. His desire is that we could believe. That we'd believe it so much that when we're faced with suffering, when we're say, faced with hatred, when we're faced with death, that we'll be not only able to just suffer through it, but we'll have joy. Because we know where we're going to go. That Jesus has gone to prepare this place. That we are loved, that he's present with us. And that we have a future together with him. And that we have a part to play, an important part that he's left us to bring others to that same position. That could be family members that don't believe could be workmates, it could be anyone that we brush, we meet in the street. His desire is for us there as he's facing death. It's a prayer not just for 2,000 years ago, it's a prayer for us today. And the challenge is, will we live it out? We know what we have to do, but will, are we doing it? And will we do it? And I'll just close on that thought. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as you were faced with death on a cross, as the world thought it had its victory over you, Lord, your desire was for us then, and you show that it's been for us all throughout history, Lord, is that men might believe in you and have life. You've never sought our death or our destruction. And Lord, you've thought of us all those years ago, not to put up with a life of suffering, but one that can be filled with joy, one with purpose, one with meaning, Lord, one with glory where we can be remembered. Not just for a few years when men will forget us, but Lord, because you know us, we can be remembered forever. We can have that glory forever, Lord, of dwelling with you and being known by you for all eternity.